<laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. And only for a few more weeks. So. Hmm? Exactly. I'd like to welcome everybody to our second event in the Brodsky series for the advancement of library and cons of library conservation, and um, which seeks to promote and advance knowledge of library conservation theory, practice, and application among wide audiences, both on campus and the region. I'm really pleased to see that the region is out in force. How many here from Rochester? <laughs> <laughs> Utica's represented. Utica, good. All right, and then our resident locals. Which is, thank you very much for coming on an absolutely miserable day. And thanks to Joan and Bill for making this series possible. Joan is here and will be attending the workshop. Tonight, Katie Kyle will be speaking about conservation of book arts, creative and innovative solutions for preserving library and archival materials. The relationship between conservation and book arts is a very symbiotic one in which ideas, techniques, and innovation flow freely in both directions. In that environment, it should be no surprise that a great many conservators are also practicing book artists and vice versa. Hedy Kyle personifies this symbiosis, having worked as a conservator at the New York Botanical Garden Library and until recently at the American Philosophical Society where she was head conservator. She's also an adjunct professor at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia and teaches book structures to MFA students. As a conservator and book artist, she was very instrumental in developing a variety of structures and enclosures which have seen widespread adoption and adaptation by professionals and amateurs everywhere. Hedy Kyle graduated from the Werkkunstschule in Wiesbaden, Germany. After a brief career as a graphic designer, her interest turned to book arts and book conservation. She's a co-founder of Paper and Book Intensive, which is a two-week or one-week series of workshops to the book arts that travels around, and has given workshops in the United States, Canada, Switzerland, and is here, and let's welcome her. much for coming and um, I wasn't really sure what to expect. I was kind of, uh, because of the nature of the workshop and so I thought there would be all students but now there's this group of um, important looking people. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, um, I hope that this isn't, um, nah, whatever, it is what it is. So um, I'm, um, I was trying to put this lecture together in in view of my workshop tomorrow, where we are going to do a um, nest of enclosures, which starts with a tiny little box and grows and grows and everything fits together. And so I was putting my main focus um, on how to protect materials in libraries, but also, of course, this could be translated to your own collections at home or any other kind of collections that you may want to work on. and. Um, Let's start. So can I can you turn the light out? So we all know that books are endangered and that they have undergone um, <coughs> extremities and it's not only the environment but it's um, neglect, um, vermin, <laughs> and also a total misunderstanding of, of what a book is about. <laughs> I have become very interested in following uh, the history of the books through paintings to see how, especially the way people read books and um, through the history of the book and the history of painting, we see a definite a change in attitudes towards the book and in the reading mode from, from more um, you know freestyle chaotic, chaotic or very um, respectful in all ways and I have probably oh, over 300 slides now of books and paintings so I just picked out a few that seem to fit this kind of reading mode and <laughs> this would be and this is one of the reasons uh, this 
picture to me is always kind of indicated by saying that the book would be obsolete is not really, um, cannot really happen. I mean, how would you do this and be at the same time researching the computer or being on the internet or it's, you know, it's just such an incredible instrument that you can manipulate with your hands and bring into its function. But at the same time, the hands are like the one instrument that is to me uh, relates directly to the book. It's not only, it's manipulative, it's uh, putting the, the, the mechanism of this incredible device into action and also making sure that it will be protected. Never mind the gloves. <laughs> That's, of course, also part of it. But the raw hands are, can be very um, beneficial to books, in my opinion. So we all know that this kind of picture and every library, I don't think there's a library yet, uh, in maybe very new libraries, that doesn't have a, a back room or a back shelf or many back shelves that still look like this. And <coughs> When we, blend, when we close in, we see the books a little more detailed and we find out that there are many books that are really in very regrettable state and need our attention and need conservation, rebinding or enclosures. There was also a time when, before conservation really took off in the late 60s, when almost every library had the so-called amending department where they did mm -hmm. some um, initial kind of quick repair or also like here this reinforcement of pamphlets, which is almost today, um, you know, we cannot really conceive of this anymore, how you would put these shoestrings through a <laughs> delicate text block and of, of course all these things have now, to, have, now um, have to be reversed and like these repairs here which I found actually I, I have a collection of ill repaired books <laughs> and um, I haven't taken slides lately but these slides are from a little earlier but I found some really gross repairs um, lately too. I look also at flea markets or wherever or um, secondhand bookstores for these kind of examples. And it always kind of baffles me how, how, why you have to go so far over this really beautiful old paper, um, you know, when you could just do a little reinforcement or make it a little more aesthetically um, pleasing to go along with the um, book cover that's already there, but anyway. So these things have to be usually redone, except some I have in my collection, I keep some just for the reference and for the, um, you know, to show students and to have around as examples what should not be done. And those are some of that. When I first started in 1971 to study with Laura Young and I had gotten my first conservation job, I mean I was a conservation intern at the New York Botanical Garden, um, basically working on pamphlets, but after a short time they they kind of thought it would be worthwhile to send me to Laura Young who taught um, book binding and conservation. And she taught me the almost anything I know about this kind of binding, even though I did later take other workshops with people and I also tried and error and my own um, ambition to learn. But in the beginning, these were the first books I restored um, under her tutelage. And this was like, you know, really time consuming and they were considered, I mean, they were actually period bindings. They were really close related to the bindings that these books had been in before. The one in the middle was a whole um, set and so I learned a lot by doing that, but 
the, the job I had as a New York Botanical Garden was not paying for this kind of um, um, work, really. I mean, they had too many problems uh, on the later, uh, on the larger aspect of their library collection that they couldn't really afford to pay that much attention to single volumes. And every time they got little money or grants or so, they would send the books to Laura Young or some other conservators that would do special books, but the general collection was not anything near this kind of attention. You know, this is like the, the cream of the crop, I would say. And we worked on these books um, to some extent, and I really liked it, and I was kind of trying to convince the librarian that this is all we should be doing, but he was not going for it. And <laughs> so we, we quickly learned also to uh, do some much faster repairs, especially on books like these these volumes here, uh, are, um, they, they're very large and they, um, those are early um, Pennsylvania newspapers that are bound in these volumes and it wasn't really feasible to go like ahead like the p picture I just showed you before. So we devised a very quick method but still a very good method. I mean, we sewn on raised bands and then of course this incredible technique that Don Essington promoted um, many years ago um, the Japanese paper mending. They dye, they buy very exquisite, long fiber, good Japanese paper. You dye it in several tones and um, make it almost match like the color of the leather and you can also coat it and polish it so it almost looks like leather. But it's thin, it doesn't need to be paired. It's a wonderful uh, pliable material that smooths over it and uh, it's great. So I'm very much excited about that and was. And um, here's another, a whole row of these kind of books that were done and sometimes you would go in and tone them. This is like after they've just been done. Tone them to adjust the color but on the other hand, you know, depending on the kind of books they are and how many we um, have made, we just may leave them. The sound, they can be opened well they're definitely accessible to the patient. And then on the other hand, starting in the 70s, there was of course this big movement of big, but many of the conservators, um, uh, I would like, just like to mention the English um, conservators, Chris Clarkson and Tony Kane and um, Peter Waters and Don Essington. Gary Forst, um, Pam Spitzmüller, uh, Tim Barrett, who created the paper for these bindings, this wonderful Iowa case paper that was made out of 100% flax and incredibly strong, uh, stronger than leather and much less expensive than vellum. So there were these conservation bindings devised that were basically non-adhesive. The text block was sewn. Um, uh, with, uh, on or without support and then laced into these uh, paper covers with, with vellum, um, vellum reinforcements. And it was really, uh, these bindings are aesthetically very uh, much to my taste and I really like doing them and they're um, totally reversible. They're, uh, they, they have everything what you would expect from a from a good book, a, a, a book that protects uh, an ancient or old text. And uh, the other great thing about them is that um, they can be at any time um, easily taken off the book and the book can be rebound if it ever should be necessary. But they also do no damage to the book and they're completely free of any kind of fussy um, decoration, stamping, gold tooling, nothing like that. It's just the material, um, good craftsmanship, and that speaks for itself. So I'm very much in favor of these bindings, and we have done a great number of those, but nothing in comparison with the, uh, uh, here are some uh, uh, small oh, limb, vellum bindings oh. that are then <coughs> put into a little folder and a linen a slipcase. And then of course the, the paste paper books uh, that have either 
cloth spines or paper spines, the handmade paper again, and at the latest, um, as the latest experiment, also dyed Tyvek spines. Uh, the sides are paste papers that we usually make ourselves, and we have like a, a couple of days every summer when the weather is very not too hot and beautiful. We go out in the backyard. The APS had a wonderful, great garden in the back where we just make paste papers to our heart's delight. It just goes <laughs> on for hours and hours, and we make huge piles, and then we have enough for the whole year. And we, we use them on books, um, boxes, folders, whatever. And of course, the paste papers we find in our library, and uh, these books came from Maine, uh, a collection that we got a couple of years ago. Um, and you can see that these paste papers are not something that is an invention of, of our time, but they were already, they were made um, way back in the 16th century, 15th and 16th century, especially in, in Europe, and then they would come later, they would come here, and they were usually made right in the bindery, different from marble paper that was uh, purchased by the binders and not often made by themselves. This is so uh, simple, so direct. You just cook up some paste out of flour and uh, or starch, and like pretty much like a gravy basis, and you mix in color and you go ahead. You know, you just daub with a brush. Like this here is a really fat brush that is loaded with the paste and the pigment, and you just keep on swapping it on the paper. And then this other one is like a little more intricate with the Kovic. So I'm really in love with these old paste papers and I have saved some of them. Of course, we don't take them off anymore. When, when we have books with them, we don't combine any, any books with these paste papers on. But my predecessor and also in the other libraries that I've worked, it wasn't, it wasn't always understood that this is something that you should save. You know, They actually ended up in the wastebasket, believe it or not. I've seen it myself at the, at the Museum of Natural History. This looks like, oh, these are dirty, old, you know, let's, get, let's put new covers on. So I have a little collection of old paste papers that I soaked off and you know, took off the boards, but not too many because you know, most of them stay. And then the other papers um, that are really fascinating are the Dutch, um, the Dutch guild papers, which were um, a stencil, the color is stenciled, and then there was a, gil a gilded print, a, an embossed print on top of them. And those came from Europe, and they were kind of rare in this country. And so this is, this is um, from the Benjamin Franklin collection, um, the library that I work worked in, the American Philosophical Society, is founded, was founded by Benjamin Franklin. And these books were in his personal collection, and they're they're bound in America, so they had this paper um, available, you know, at some point. And of course, these books would never, I would never ever do anything to them. I would just um, uh, enclose them, put them in boxes and protect them, because mm -hmm. it would be such a shame to destroy that, even though some, you know, there, there is definitely already, uh, like this book too, you know. But I know from other libraries and when books like this and, and Chris Clarkson always takes tells this horrible story of one of the beautiful um, long stitch bindings in the Herzog August library in Wolfenbüttel in Germany that he was asking to look at so they brought it out with some other books and it was on the book truck when he left and the next time he came back and asked for the same book, it had been rebound. And it was like this. It wouldn't even close anymore. It was rebound in vellum, but everything was wrong, and the grain and the boards. And he said he was so, he, he felt so responsible because he had brought the attention to this book that hadn't been looked in maybe a hundred years. And they saw it on the truck and they said, this book needs rebound. <laughs> And they took it really and they, they ruined it. So this is what happens, you know, like you, you really, I think that's why it's important to educate people, to show them these things, to make them love them. 
because we have um, at the APS we did almost every year we did exhibits showing exactly this kind of thing. We had like these showcases and we would put like a whole row of books like this in there and make people aware of them um, that these look like archaeological ruins actually. You know, they're not there's something really beautiful about them and there's something interesting because you can tell uh, first of all you can tell how they were bound that they were very simple you know like the paper was just glued over the spine these are all American imprints and then the most interesting thing is these books are also from that same family in Maine that they did extensive home repair and they've just took some checkered linen and reinforced the spine now, if you if you redo that, you know, it will be lost. I mean, I think there's also a history of just like I say, with these other books that were, where this is not a great repair either, but it's a much older repair. So uh, there are even older repairs, and I'm really interested in the history of book repair because if you look at other things, uh, repairs are usually done quite well, um, like clothes or shoes or furniture. If you look at books, I mean, look at this. It's like totally haphazardly done, and yet it's really beautiful to me. It's they're small books, as you can see, because they're standing on a big book, and they're all children's books. And so, what you can imagine is that, of course, this, the kids were rough on their books, and maybe their nanny or their older sister or mother reinforce them ever so often because books were not that easy to come by. Mm -hmm. So there is this row of books and of course this is like one of the things that we would exhibit now and then. You know, we would pick out these things and and write a long label, tell people what's happening and believe it or not, people are really interested in it. They're just kind of tired to go to this exhibit and see like one fancy book open with a nice illustration and a gilded edge. And I have no idea that this stuff exists too. I mean, this is um, also interesting. And here's another one where they reinforce the sewing. And then this is just, I don't know, I just love that, the way, the way, it, you know, the color combination. And, and it just happened to be all together on the shelf. And, so, anyway, uh, these books are also from that collection, and the top ones are interested, interesting because they, they're early um, American bindings with the marble paper um, directly glued to the spine. So this is kind of what you hope to achieve after <coughs> maybe a year of work, and it's a mix, a mixture of. Um, mending this Japanese paper, uh, rebinding some of them, and a lot of enclosures, as you can see, boxes and wrappers. As we done, we, I come later to that. But these, all these lighter things, are what we call self-closing wrappers and slipcases that we've made hundreds and thousands of over the years. And at first, um, I just marked them because they are supposed to be a temporary solution, not forever. So you mark them, what should happen? Or oh, this is how it started out. What should happen to this book? Should it be rebound? Should it be put in a clamshell bo box? Should it, you know, whatever. So you mark it and you put the call number on. So then all the people in the library, the pages and the librarians come and say, ah, oh, this is horrible. I can't find anything anymore. Um, what have you done, you know, the whole, Shelf looks slipcase after slipcase, totally boring. So then slowly I decided, okay, we're going to Xerox all the spines of the books and we put them on. So then they have a little bit more orientation. And now, of course, we scan them and we color them, uh, print them out, color, we put the call number right in on this, um, in Photoshop and they look almost like the books. <laughs> I don't have a slide of it, unfortunately, but and lo now they're happy because they see that ever s everything looks almost exactly like it did before. And that's important too, because if people don't 
can't work with these enclosures, and it's not really the full purpose is not achieved. So this was my first um, enclosure kit when I was working at the New York Botanical Garden. We were trying to get a grant from the A.W. Wilson Company, and so I made this little kit, and it has like a number of um, samples of enclosures and um, one or two rebindings, pamphlet binding and a quick uh, paste paper case binding. And so then I showed it to John Reed, who was a librarian at the time, and then he said, make 20 of them. We're giving each member of the, of the panel one set, and let's see whether we get the grant. So we made 20, we gave them all one, and they were so, um, because they usually have piles of paper in front of them and have to just go through the paperwork, so they had something tactile that they could pull out, look at. We got the grant. And then we did another, um, we did a lot of workshops for libraries and wrote a book on library preservation materials and had jobs for two or three years because that was always a problem with the botanical garden. Then we made this thing here. This is like um, the follow-up of the kit. Uh, it has, no, the follow-up, yeah, of that little box that I just show, showed. This is like an instruction kit where each of those things is explained and this pre-cut components and you can put it together and teach yourself how to make it. So these enclosures were already in use when I started at the New York Botanical Garden. I guess everybody who works in the library or in conservation knows those. They were developed by uh, the Library of Congress and by various other places. They do require certain kinds of equipment like a crimper and um, and also the, you know, to attach so the hardware there. And they, they're not for everything. I mean, they're, they're, they're okay, we, we did them too, but then we decided we really wanted to, uh, we needed, we couldn't spend that much money. It was always also too much, um, the material was too expensive. So we went with this cheaper material, which is a 20 point library board and acid free, of course. And we and I developed this wrapper here that's called the self-closing wrapper. Very simple, just goes a, a vertical, I mean a horizontal strip and a vertical strip. It's attached at the back, and then the flap, you know, two go up and this flap goes in, and that works really well. And it's really cheap to make and quick to make. Like uh, we we had then volunteers that we taught how to do it, and we got. The, the, the things we invested a little money in was the corner rounder, you can see the corners around it, and the some notch chisel. Because I found out that if people have a few tools that make things look a little neater and more professional, they are much happier with their work than if they just have like pokey corners and, and have to cut this thing by hand and it doesn't really look good. So a few things um, are important that, that you know, and they, they can help facilitate this and make the people happier, the volunteers and the students. And this was a wrapper I devised for, for those books without, with the boards detached, rather than putting that awful rubber band or string around them to hold them. Um, I used the covers as part of the reinforcement for the wrapper, so this cover will Pull, push in, then the whole thing flap over, go on the book, rest in that little, um, at the joint, and then the flaps will go into the double layer of the, of the wrapper. And so the whole thing is together, and it's almost like a slipcase, and it's also very fast, and this is definitely a stopgap um, procedure, you know, sooner or later something has to happen, but when that will be at least they are protected. And on the left there comes this really handy box that's made out of a, a, a multi-use board cut out of one piece and uh, it's called a multi-use box and we will make that tomorrow as a final enclosure of our nest. So we devised a lot of different enclosures, um, custom made for, for things and always saving uh, the 
whatever <coughs> comes with a book, what's detached or, um, you know, as an artifact and also maybe uh, for um, the historical evidence for exhibition purposes and maybe for a later attachment, which is not likely to happen, but it should be there as part of the book's history. There's another enclosure or two, like a slipcase and a wrapper. And these are slipcases that um, have a double volume of, of uh, wrappers inside. And I, I, we got, as the American Philosophical Society, in the last years I was there, we got also a grant. And I, I found a woman on, on, in one of my workshops who really wanted to get into conservation and wanted to get a job. And I said, we have a job for you. You can make s thousands of these. <laughs> That was a grand for, and I didn't think, and it was so incredible. This woman sat there and did, I mean, perfected it. And you should have seen the wall later. It was, unfortunately, I don't have a slide, but it was really a sight to behold. It was like, you know, thousand slipcases, all in these. She had fun with the colors. She, she used book class, and the spine at the end is book class. So it looks all, you know, she arranged mm -hmm. them all by color. It was great. and took her one year to do that. And she had to take the pamphlets also apart out of these um, volumes where they were. So this is that same slipcase. Instead of one, I hinged several together. And this is what I call the multi-slipcase. So this can be used for, let's say you have five pamphlets or um, any kind of collection, correspondence, or, um, or even smaller books, this, this will make a nice enclosure and it's not that difficult to make. So then of course comes the clamshell boxes that we make a lot of and we make them uh, pretty non I mean, very utilitarian without too much um, decoration or fancy papers or so, just good quality book class, um, acid-free lining and so. So um, also kind of gleaned from archive, uh, from medieval books. There used to be these books that were called uh, box books, where the book was bound into a box. And the covers closed. And when you open it, the, books, the box comes out. I was always fascinated by it. And of course, this is also, I, I've seen this. A lot of other people have done this. But this is where it comes from. So it's a. Um, a mylar, mylar pages that are like a, um, a stab, bi a stab binding, no, the binding with a with a post, a post binding. is uh, is attached. I think I have another slide. Oh no, it comes later. And so you open it up, and the pages move easily back and forth, and this is really great for storage of, of you know, fragile um, materials. Once in a while we would encapsulate a whole book. We have one of those ultrasonic encapsulators, and that's a lot of work, but it's something that we had uh, some of our interns or volunteers do, and it worked out pretty good. And it's amazing how, how much, you know, this book was so, so brittle, I mean, you couldn't even barely look at it and it would already crumble. And so then you can already you can handle it again. And I devised this little box that I call an inset box because often, uh, I mean, we always see in boxes with where smaller books fit in, but they're really complex. My predecessor used to make them and they were very beautiful, but they took like about two days to make. And so this one is just really simple. It's it's made out of this 20 point, and um, we'll make one tomorrow, so I don't want to go into this now, but I have also some samples later for you to look at. And here's the same inside boxes for daguerreotypes, and then they're housed um, in one of those multi-use boxes. So now we're going to look at some um, historical enclosures. As far as books 
go are concerned, there aren't really that many. I mean, you, you, you don't very often find books in an enclosure that was meant for that book. The enclosure was mostly made later, uh, at another time. And this is not really a protective enclosure to speak of um, completely, but it has like the, the um, beginnings of it. It is more protective than just the cover. Um, because of the, you know, the, the top of a book is um, more protected. And then, of course, um, you can imagine that you can wrap that leather cover more around it to make it completely protected. And this is a prototype that was made by Pam Spitzmüller. She's really um, into these researching all these and uh, it's great. I, I, I learned, you know, this is wonderful how we all kind of cooperated, um, especially in the early years. And it's not, but we all still know each other. And it's, uh, but in the beginning, we were always discussing everything. And whoever had a new idea, people were interested in exploring it. And I think this um, paper and book intensive was a very fruitful gathering for many of us because, as Peter said before, a um, number of conservators are also book artists and so there was this incredible exchange and Pam and, and I have always been on the same level of, of you know of excitement. She she goes into a different direction which is good too so we can have a lot of exchange. So this little book is um called the um, does anybody know this book? Have you seen this before? Because this is kind of uh, the same time as a Gerda book, and it's very rare, actually. I, I, uh, I think there are only like two or three in this country, and there are a few in Europe. They're called, um, well, it's, 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 I can't, Silmai calls this um, Vade Mecum. In other words, Come With Me, a book that was carried by physicians on their belt. Now, you see the pages. They're, they're folded. Um, you fold them out first this way, then you fold them this way. So each page actually extends uh, eight times its size, and sometimes more, and sometimes only six times, depends. And so it's like, um, as it hangs here, you open up the page, there you have this big page. So it also hangs upside down, and there's this German um, researcher who has been chasing these books and tracking them down, and he calls them in German Fledermausbuch. <laughs> and so I just translated it to bad book. So I call them bad book because they are like a bat that hangs on its, you know, upside down with the wings spread out or closed. And they're, they're really um, quite incredible. I found one in Philadelphia, we have one at the Rosenbach collection. And it's very brittle, but it's. But you see, there is now the beginning of a wrapper underneath the cover. This is a little distorted. The pages are all the same size, and the cover is too. So then comes this, this flap, and then the side flap, and then the cover will go over that. So there is some protection there. And this is the next book. Um, where taken, these are the slides that were taken by Nora Liguano when she was um, in Barcelona, like, Oh, I think it was almost 20 years ago, and she did some research at the library there, and she she gave me those slides. Unfortunately, I was just saying to Peter before, this is the kind of thing that, that there is hardly any book on, on on the history of a book that shows you this kind of binding. They always show you the same thing over and over again, the important bindings. But these are so um, fascinating to me, and I would like to know more about, um, you know, but I guess one has to go and look at them like Noah did. And this is also not exactly an enclosure, but it's a, it's the, um, it's a replica of one of the codices, A, B, C, D, E. This one is from Michigan, and the other uh, A, B, C are in, at the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin. And they all were found in Egypt, and they're very fra fragmented. So. The reconstruction uh, is based on, I think, one of the, uh, on Codex A, which had uh, the most evidence. But again, um, when you see how often these, these um, wraps are 
go around the book, you wonder, this can't just be to hold the book together. I mean, it also protects the book, even though the corners are unprotected, but it's more like a package. So it, I, I included it here because I thought it was kind of like an enclosure. Now this book is, um, is from, uh, from Sumatra and the people who wrote these books or made these books are called the Bartak people. And we have a whole collection of these at the American Philosophical Society. One of the reasons I took the job there, when I, I saw them the first when I had my interview, they showed them to me because I said, well, don't you have any older books <laughs> or something <laughs> interesting? <laughs> because everything was, you know, it's a very kind of American library. It doesn't have mm -hmm. all these treasures that, you know, Gerda books and all that. They said, oh yeah, we have something really great. And so they showed me these Bartak books and they are so incredible. They are made, they're in size, um, the, the page material is, is a bark from a tree. I don't know exactly what tree. I haven't found that out yet. But um, then the, the writing is in size with a sharp instrument and blackened with um, soot or you know, some dark substance. And they, they were medicine books, um, shaman books, like mystical. And this particular one was in that little woven case, which is really beautiful. And actually, I always wanted to make it. A, and I tried, I started, but I haven't finished it yet. It's, um, I, I, I try to make it out of that timber paper, you know, cut small strips. Anyway, we just um, temporarily put it in a box. And it's very fragile now. There's another Bartak book. And then this book is, um, I took this slide for, for out of the catalog of the Library of Congress collection because I really like the way this is protected. Look at this. Four <laughs> times. It goes on and on. It's just, you know, with other books are underprotected here, it's like <laughs> over the top. And this was a saddle book. So this went on trips with, um, on horse rides, and I guess that's why. And it's the Quran, so. And this also, this is a little Coptic binding in its bag. The bag going with the book, supposedly. And then this strange thing <laughs> is, um, it's also an enclosure. Japanese books were always <laughs> Uh, when I first learned about them in the beginning of my, or at least really learned about them and saw them with different eyes, uh, I was really fascinated. I still am. I think they are just, um, there's a whole other philosophy behind them. And of course, most of it has to do with the, with the nature of the paper uh, because it's so light and it's translucent. So they have um, a whole other book form where the fold is in the front as in our uh, codex the fold is at the spine and they are flexible they are <coughs> lightweight There's, the binding is minimal I don't know, if I should have um, caught your attention to that very <coughs> heavy book that was I don't know if you remember, it was in a box there was a dictionary, with one stitch through the whole huge stack of paper and a little support of thin bamboo splints but here, you know, these books are are so easy to um, to restore again or rebind anyway. You know the pages are less easy to do if they're if they're damaged. But and the enclosures are also very handsome and very um, suitable. Like here's a small set of of books and they go into this little um, wrapper. This is a very fancy wrapper where the, the side fits exactly into, you know, they, they make a, a, a complete filled surface when, the, when they're all together. And this is a special, I mean, this is not preservation, this is more, this is fancy. Yeah, and here are again like some homemade um, protective measures. I think everybody who 
who works in conservation has probably seen these kind of linen wrappers that they, they, they I think they're very typical for American um, for the 19th century and maybe even 17th, 18th century uh, that that was a style especially this was definitely a home a home kind of thing and usually old linen maybe tablecloths sheets blankets whatever clothes they used to make these enclosures where the or, or maybe better to say yeah it's an enclosure it's it's kind of related to the later school wrapper school book wrapper but they always had these stitches that that held those um, head and tail flaps together and the the corners were sewn and I've seen them usually they are linen and um, in different kind of they're never very carefully made I mean when you when you look at the, the the effort they put into clothes making and then they make these wrappers and they're just kind of funky but they're they're nice and then this this is from the archive um, a, a man that that uh, spent a lot of um, research and then in the um, South Sea, and he put his journals into this very colorful cloth that he stitched together and protected in that way. So um, one of my interests has been in the in the ar archives to find collections of strange things and bring them out into the <laughs> light and make the curators aware of them because they don't really ever have a chance to find them and nobody can tell them that they're there because they're not catalogued in that way. They're catalogued by title and author, mm. but they, you would never know when, you, when you're looking for something like, you know, that you find this. <laughs> this, this is maybe under the name of, of the person that gave that, his uh, collection to the APS and in all these <coughs> boxes you find this little book with cigar labels. Mm. And who will ever know it? But it would be perfect material for a little exhibit or you know, to show for show and tell. So I, I did a lot of searching for the, this is another um, um, a catalog for the Quaker Lace Company. They drew their patterns at the hand, watercolor on, on um, grid paper, hundreds of them, hundreds of them. And so, you know, this, is, this was just wood in the archives. So. Fortunately, my assistant, Denise Carbon, she's now the conservator, we had, uh, we had exactly the same um, attitude and the, the, in, you know, the, 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 the interest to go. And we would like, every once in a while, we'd spend the whole day just sniffing, going around and finding stuff. <laughs> and, then, and then saying, OK, we're going to make an exhibit. And now, um, I, uh, we have a new curator, um, and she she has put up some really good exhibits, um, big exhibits. But she's like ever thankful to us that we can point her in this direction and show her things that she can use. For instance, uh, this will come. So anyway, you know this also a collection of letters. And um, what's interesting about here is that people used to write to save paper to write one direction and then the other direction, uh, like in a, in a, a crisscross. And then there's also there's some poems written on, on birch bark. So this is a nice collection. And now that not too many people write letters anymore, I mean, letters become also something that you want to cherish and bring out to show to people. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to keep it in, uh, uh, just this. And this is not really all that interesting, interesting to researchers, except, I mean, it depends who the researcher is. But the researchers we get at the APS are usually people who want to look at scientific material or, you know, whatever, but not at this kind of thing. So it's important to, this is what I meant. Now, how would you ever <laughs> find this or, or even know it was existing? It was this, this, this guy that in New Jersey that did research on chickens. <laughs> and he had all these books with, where he entered all the chickens, their names, their, their age, their <laughs> peculiarities, how many eggs they laid. And the books themselves are really fantastic. Like they, you know, if there was a, a rip in the page, he would take a piece of a step, you know, of 
part of a stamp or anything that had something blue on the back and just fix it. And so the whole books are kind of um, they're, they're great. Anyway, so he has all these um, these different feathers in these envelopes. And so I told Sue Ann Prince, our curator, about it, and she said, I gotta see this. And then when she saw it, she went, so she put them in the exhibit that you have to imagine a room where she's showing uh, the um, the handwritten independence, you know, um, Jefferson's, you know, draft of <laughs> on one hand, and in the same room she's showing this, and it all goes together, it ties in, you know, because it's called like the the treasures of uh, you know of the APS or so. I mean, this is a treasure too, in a way, like to make people aware that not everything has to be worth a million dollars or done by famous people, but this is this is an, a, a totally unexpected kind of thing that you find. So the letter file, more with those letters, and, and then the scrapbooks that can be a nightmare, you know, that because the, the thing with them is that there's so much material, and it's so um, labor intensive to separate it, soak it off, save it, rehouse it, that I don't know, I mean, we worked on many of them, but we couldn't, this, this collection was, um, these are small watercolors of bugs and of a French uh, scientist, and they were never published. And they, there's 3,000 of them, and they were in these huge um, albums with very acidic pages glued shut. Mm -hmm. And I did some, you know, at first we started taking them off the support from the back, very carefully scraping, and, you know, oh, I could just see us doing this forever. So I called and talk to colleagues and Jeff Rigby in Hudson, New York, he, he's a conservator in private practice and I talked to him and he said he was working on some um, watercolors from the from a, uh, same time period and had the same problem and he just finally, first he started to float them and he finally just dunked them in the water and nothing happened. The, the watercolor, just like ink, you have to, I mean, you have to be very careful and test and test, but eventually that's what we did, and we were, it was great. It was completely, not one little run or anything. So we were able to get them all off and then put them into these, what I showed you before as a, as a prototype, this is now the real thing, the, the step, um, I can't still think of the name. What are those bindings? Oh, post. Post bind, yeah. The post binding was supposed, and you can, you know, another thing is, of course, you might, these things need to be removable because maybe somebody wants to use them as book illustrations or exhibit them, not the whole book, but pages. So here's a scrapbook that we gave one of, one of our volunteers to take apart and reassemble, and that's a good thing to, I've been very happy with volunteers, actually. I know some, some places don't like to take them, but We've been really extremely um, lucky to, to have good volunteers that stick with us like for years and years, come regularly, once a week or twice a week, and are not, you know, do anything we tell them, and just labor intensive things, repetitive things, and so it's been a really good experience. This again is like a small uh, ephemera that goes into this, what I call a storage book, the double you know, pages with some cut out and maybe a mylar, they go into mylar envelopes that then slide in there. Okay, now we need that. Can you still, I have a whole other tail. I go a little faster. I don't want to make it too. Yeah, and this is another collection that was in a brittle album that we took out and then um, dealt with it in this, not all of them, but some of them were put into this kind of enclosure and others were more. Here's this, um, a photograph that was cracked, but goes, a lot, goes with this letter, so the whole thing was supposed to be kept together, and so that's what this is. And a scrapbook, there was actually, um, there are eight of these scrapbooks 
done by a, a man and a wife who took many trips to Japan and they're really quite well done and they donated them to the APS and so we don't have to do, I wish they were all like that, they, you don't have to do anything to them, they're really well. And this is a really um, interesting little enclosure of, from the Franklin collection, a recycled piece of vellum and a little folder and you open it and there is the money that he designed with the vegetable prints on them. So this was his um, and you see the, the, the vellum is from an indenture so he, mm -hmm. I mean this is not that he made this but somebody at that time made it and recycled the indenture and these are checks, and I just put them, um, this, these are the cancelled marks, you know, which is interesting. The hand cut cancelled marks, so that's why I put the, put the dark paper behind. Another enclosure with ephemera in a box. And a little briefcase from the David Seller collection. He was the first paper maker in America. And this is a weird thing. This is <laughs> this. I my son-in-law gave me this for Mother's Day, and I, I just had to put it in here. And actually, it comes. Uh, this is only part of it. It comes in a in a metal tube, and what it is is like a receipt receptacle in a drugstore, so that wooden thing you can pull it up and put it over the hook, and during the day all the receipts get to like on a spindle file. And then it's in this tube, which makes it kind of round, like a big fat worm or something. <laughs> it's really funny. And the last receipts were put on in 1956. <laughs> so it's not that, you know, it started like in the... These are also from the Bartak people of Sumatra, the ones I showed the magic books on the bar print. And these are bamboo um, pieces that are inscribed. Um, this, uh, these are more secular; they're not so sacred. A little dust boom made of made out of a plant. Uh, all the stuff you find in the archives is that people put in with other things, and it would just be forgotten if it wasn't. Now, this is a, an interesting collection of a, of of a scientist, um, and she had all these little um, testing, you know, these little testing tubes with different. So how do you deal with that? Because they want to put them in these archival boxes. So we made these folders where those tiny vials can sit in a, a fun little box. <laughs> that just, you know, we just, everything that was in that box, we kept in it, but we put it like, this was just like a little placing. I mean, this didn't happen, so. I would say this is kind of obsessive, but <laughs> <laughs> but look at the the hair the hair uh, woven these things here the morning jewelry they made this um, they wove these out of um, the hair of the deceased and then it was uh, often worn as bracelets or necklaces and it has this really incredible springy. Um, Characteristic, like a horsehair, you know, horsehair is like that, except not, this is not a stuff, so there's all kinds of stuff like that. And then I found this little envelope where somebody had cut out all these cats, and I said, well, th this is what I like to do, you know, just figure out how can you display this, um, you know, and have, have some fun with it at the same time. So I just took the the chisel and made these cuts mm -hmm. through all the pages and just stuck these things in there. So these are like, this I, I did already in the 80s. This was my first, um, my first uh, attempt to, when, when I was talking before about the box book. The next few slides will show some enclosures that for how I work at home and if I get an idea, um, so it can be either conservation or book art. It doesn't, you know, it's, it, it depends, like, where you want to take it and what materials you want to use. And 
how you want to execute it. So this became as a storage book for a lot of things in the archives where, where things, you know, I showed you the, the, in the Myla sleeves that can be removed, but I also use it in my own uh, book work for s other things like here. And then I'm um, always interested in folding. And this is a big piece of tieback folded into this little uh, pocket book that um, became a sampler for some of the paper from the, the cave paper. And here's some other folders that can also be either sample book. I mean, these can be made in any size. The only thing is you, you do need a, a fairly large piece of paper to make them. But they could also be. This is a soft uh, slip case that that is just. And and I have things here that you can look at later. And these will be here. That's also folded just out of. Um, this is a Timbal paper, and this fits over that. And a tieback pocket. And this is one of my newer book structures where, where I'm trying to create some space between the pages. So I start with a little pyramid and then they get bigger and bigger. And s s you can see how the I can put these boxes between each because it's like a quarter of an inch. And then this can become a, a book uh, for to display three-dimensional objects. And this is the multi uh, the multi slipcase again and about much thinner. I'm looking at it sometimes also as a book with thick pages. You know, instead of the page having the text or the images on it, it's really fine and thin, but it has it enclosed so you can pull it out and carry it inside. Here's another one. Um, this is like a display of soap ends. <laughs> yeah, they. I, I like them. They they become very uh, different also from what they looked before inside. And another collection of boxes, natural objects. Flower petals. Um, skin samples. This is by Pam Spitzmuller. And a whole array of envelopes that I think everybody should at least know how to make three of them. Because it's always, if you have something, whether it's a few buttons or some seeds or whatever, you always need something. And if you c are really quick, um, I mean, if you really can remember these envelopes, you can make them in, in two seconds or, or one minute. The one on the top where it said Gloucester, mm -hmm. I don't know whether anybody recognizes, because that was a Christmas card of Terry Ballinger a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, it was funny because at the same time, I had discovered that envelope also in our archives in a collection. Mm -hmm. it, it's an envelope that... Um, that people before postal envelopes were on the market and when letters were still hand delivered, they folded their letters into um, this particular form. I mean, this is one of them. There are others. There are others. But this is like the historical one that he found in the in Virginia, and I found it. And so we exchanged some some uh, notes on it. Uh, this is Pam Spitzmuller's idea of preserving <coughs> a book, or one of them. <laughs> I like that a lot. This is so great. And yeah, this is another pun on book container. And Gary Foss telephone, protective telephone. I mean, this is this is complex. This piece. Because he has a, the real telephone book encapsulated in, in this plastic bag. He has this new book that is done like a medieval wooden board binding 
you know, chained to the booth, <laughs> and then the whole booth also, I mean, this is really, a, and then he has all these thorns. Actually, I have that, that back part, I have the top of the booth with the drawing in the back. He didn't want it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> And this is a Dita Road book, which is also looks like a box, he made a box cover unwittingly. I mean, I don't think he had any idea about medieval uh, box books. So he just reinvented the wheel there. And Susan Chair with her incredible uh, expandable stacks, and they all fold back into a, into a box-like thing. <laughs> and the pocket book. By Lydis Bernesch, a New York artist. And this is Mindy Dubansky, who's also a conservator at the Metropolitan Museum. And this shows again, like, the, the, the close um, relationship between book arts and conservation, you know, like, the number of people wear two hats and two bows and go in either direction. And of course, it's always so, um, such, yeah, here's Denise Carbone with uh, uh, sewing text blocks. This is and I think this is probably the, the widest field, and I, I'm not sure I want to call this, I, I mean, I'm not going to call these artist books. I think it's book arts because what else would you call it? But these are books that are mostly made by conservators like Pam Spitzmüller, but it's not a book that she can put in the library. I mean, it's not a rebinding of an old text, but it's a kind of a, a play and pun on a medieval binding, and she's taking the freedom now that she probably feels often, I mean, you can't do that as a conservator. You have limits. You, you can't just go wild and start coloring things and use strange material or experiment too much. You have to stay within a certain kind of um, accepted uh, uh, yeah, <coughs> rules. You know, there are certain rules that you have to follow. But as a, as a book artist, you have this incredible freedom. You can do whatever you want. And you don't have to use uh, archival materials anymore. You can you can just go and um, and experiment with any material that comes to your mind. And metal is one of the things I found also in my students at the University of the Arts that a lot of people are very attracted to metal and try this a lot of times. And here the, the traditional linen tape is uh, painted and used not in the traditional way as where the pages are sewn onto it, but it is you know, sewn on the cover, so it's again like a, a pun on the actual thing. And this is a resin book with in, enclosed uh, flies. And um, from the Wolfenbüttel Library, one of those long stitch bindings, and here is a whole row of them. And I think these books were probably, I mean, they were kind of brought to this country. The attention, our attention was brought to them by Chris Clarkson. And then um, Pamela Spitzmüller and I went to Germany in the, I think it was like um, eight, 90, yeah, eight, 1990. And we asked for these books, and, and you know you have to sign them out. And there were only a very few names there, and there was Chris Clarkson and Tony Keynes and a couple of other people. For hundreds of years, nobody ever signed. Well, not hundreds of years, but since they kept this catalog, nobody signed these books out. And it was so fascinating to see them and and look at them. So, but. They became such a rage in this country, and you probably here, when you make books, have learned how to do these long stitch bindings. And 
Tamla was one of the big promoters. I mean, she really explored all the zones and taught many workshops on them. Frank Maori was another one. And this was like a day's output, or maybe not a day, maybe <laughs> two days or so, at PBI, where Pamela uh, Spitzmüller taught the class on long stitch bindings, and everybody just went crazy. They were so excited. And you can see the tradition is already taken over by the innovative spirit. And that's really nice to see how people come up with their, with their own. Um, and this book, this book structure really lends itself. I think it's one of the few that is so um, contemporary. I mean, this, this, this fits so well into, in, into our time and can be executed in so many different ways. Here's another one. A couple more. And these are uh, beautiful bindings that were uh, done by Joan Flash, uh, who was a student of Gary Foss in Chicago at the Art Institute and an early participant at PVI, and unfortunately she died. But she had such a, um, um, a feeling for, for transforming something that she had seen or s imagined that was old into something contemporary. You know, like, look at this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's just great. And it's another one, yeah. Mm -hmm. these two. So whenever I think of um, somebody transforming medieval bindings into a modern um, commodity that I think of her, she was really good at it. So myself, I'm, I was uh, into the concertina fold from the beginning on. That was my modus operandi. I was really intrigued by this, um, how this you know, you know, flat piece of paper, one fold makes a mountain, another fold makes a valley, like a few more folds, you have a, a sculpture, a three-dimensional object. And folding is still my my favorite um, way of coming to new structures and uh, I, I can't, you know, I, I don't think I ever do anything that doesn't have a, a couple of folds somewhere. So this book I bought in New York in the, in the 80s, early 80s, late 70s, I think. And it's a beautiful book. It's small, like about this big, and you you hold it like this, and it just kind of mm -hmm. makes a sound and goes from one side next. It's a Japanese a pilgrim. Um, yeah, the, it, it, it was, it accompanies somebody on a pilgrimage to Mount Fuji and, you know, recites the poetry in it. And it's, um, so I really am intrigued with the fold and have most of my early structures were all based on the concept of the fold. And now I'm also often doing other things. And mm -hmm. this is my April diary that was the first flag book ever that was in 1976, I think. The, the Center for Book Arts had a, a show out, out in, the, in, the, in Southampton, Long Island. And we all were doing, making books for that. And this is when I shut myself in my studio for a week. And I just came up with, with that book and then the one you And that one, and two more that I don't have in the slides here. But so that was the beginning, and you know, like what I love about it is the, 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 the just kind of the, the shadow, the light, the, the form. The, it's so pure to me, and this crispness of the fold. And so I'm hooked on the folding, and my family is mad. They <laughs> think. That they are ever going to stop folding? <laughs> they make fun of me. So this is a blizzard book, which um, comes out, out of that fold that I just showed. This is a little uh, further down the road, and this is something uh, I call it the blizzard book because I folded it on the day of the blizzard in 1996, and it just came <laughs> at the end of the day. I, it was just there, and it, um, it's you know it's a nice little book. You can see it later. 
And this is then another departure from the Blizzard book. Actually, the Blizzard book is just this, this thing here. And it's much further spread apart, and then the other pages are inset in the little flaps that it makes. So this, this is also... So I got two book structures out of it. <laughs> so and the next slides are just like... Um, I'm beginning with this one to say, yeah, as a book artist, you have the freedom. You know, you can just enjoy yourself. You can cut up books, you can do anything you want, and people do that. And it doesn't mean that that we stand behind it all and that it's it's all great what people are doing and what everybody's doing. But you have to give, you know, you, you can't forbid people not to do it. So might as well. Anyway, so I just have a few slides picked out that are, that are a little more, uh, well this one not so much, but this one is interesting because it has, um, this. it involves the scroll with the codex and so there are two elements. And this one is a, is a good example of, you know, you might as well just make the book out of the tree before you <laughs> go through the problem of making paper. <laughs> and that was one of my students that was actually a fiber in the fiber, she, she was getting a degree in fiber arts, and she was always looking at what we were doing and wanted to come to our program and then she showed us this book one day and we said yeah you can come and we said, <laughs> <laughs> it was like see the spine and then each th there are actually pages that move over and it's just amazing all made out of the safety pen and I love the way she did the title with the golden pins there I mean it's just you know it's it's just a great little idea and then this one is another student, and there's Susan Shea again. And this is one of my books, and I, I often do these books that I call, uh, actually I call them carousel books, but I know carousel book is also called something else, because they, they're, they, they're just round. They go round and round, so they're not, um, they can't really lie flat, they have to go into a round container. And this is something I, I always do like a, a, a project with my students where everybody brings in some stuff, like junk we call it. And then we put it all on the table and people draw numbers and go around and can pick up till everything is gone. You know, you pick up one thing then the next person comes, and so on. So this is what this person ended up with getting. And out of it, you make something. <coughs> and so this was one of the, and it's pretty interesting. I mean, it's a good exercise. It's not anything, um, you know, it, it frees people, and, and they're always amazed how they first think they have no idea, and then when they start working with it, they get, they get very um, excited about it. Now this is Kumi Kov, who lives in Ithaca, and you might know she does some very interesting works. And the last slide is Denise Carbon, who is, as I mentioned before, now has taken my position at the APS, and is also, um, so she's a conservator, she teaches at the University of the Arts, and she's also a book artist, and she really likes to use um, strange materials. <laughs> so this is hers. And that's it. So now I have, um, here's a box full of stuff, if you want to look, because I've, I often f do this, and I find that people always like to, especially after sitting all this long time, you want to touch maybe something and see how it <laughs> actually works. So there is... Um, these are some bigger things, but then there is this box here which has a lot of the small stuff in it. And you can just take it out as you... Does anybody have any questions? And these are things that I, that, that I consider more like... If I was a painter, I would say these are sketches. You know, these, are, these are all... like, And I take them 
I have hundreds of them, and I always take different ones. <coughs> I like the fact that they get patina of the touch, and that you know can also test them how how well do they how well do they hold up? When do they crack? When do they give up? When do I have to replenish them? And so that's partly what I bring them for. Yes, was there a question? I was going to say, if anybody yeah. has any questions. No. Yeah, oh yeah, maybe that's, excuse me, that's what we should do first. Mm -hmm. Questions. I want to go back to something you said at the beginning of the talk, which is forget about the gloves. What do you <laughs> think that some books um, have? Oh, no, no, I was just being, um, you know, I, I have never liked the gloves. I, I know, I know that, that they have a purpose, and, uh, but I think clean hands is just as good. And you know, I I feel like um, it's just it's not my thing. I I never have gloves for my books, and and I, when f I like, I mean, books need a little oil, you know, a little <laughs> grease maybe. I mean, you don't want to have spots on them. I I can understand there are certain things that you don't want it, but also the gloves are not always that great because you don't have you you're much clumsier, you know, when you when you actually touch it also they're slippery and but this is only my personal I'm not saying um, don't use any gloves everybody should do this on their you know this is this is a, a but I mean I sometimes find it funny when people have well that was a pun that there was do you know um Elsa and Kiefer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and this huge books <laughs> and he, they were exhibited at the, at the Museum of you know, Philadelphia, and they had white gloves, and all these books were so rough that it was really like you needed the gloves to protect yourself, <laughs> not to protect the book. I mean, that was great, you know, that was fun. Yeah, and there's some more questions? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, the paper is just, it could be anything. I mean, you want to use a good paper, but uh, nothing, it should be like a hard paper, and not absorbent, not an absorbent paper. Um, it's, it's a little bit like finger painting, and you know, the finger painting papers you use is very slick, and well, it's not. I really like to use uh, something called library leaf, uh, which comes from, it's, it's an archival paper, and it's very strong, and I can read it and you know, go over it many times. I also use the 10 point and the 20 point. When I use the 20 point, I can actually fold things. Well, this is an example here, but this isn't really such a good example because it's already cracking at the spine. But this is a paste paper that's made out of a 20 point. So I didn't have to cover any boards, I was just mm -hmm. using it. So ideally I would give it a new spine, and I can do this now, you know, I can put another, either a piece of Tyvek or a um, or, um, piece of paper, cloths over it. You know. But I like the idea of doing, see what I do here is I paint both sides, and then I can just use it on both sides and make it full cover. And the other thing is the tie back. No, this is also a piece of paper. There's a tie back here. This, this is a tie back dye. You can dye that with acrylic or with, uh, the best is actually acrylic ink, which is kind of a liquid, very dense um, color. And you just rub it on with a sponge. I use usually a sponge. And you know, it becomes very, it feels good. Mm -hmm. And you can get layers over it and make it very, um, this more tie back. This is a little blizzard book. This can be done in, in, it's in every um, size, but this is a size that's really great for business cards. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, any more questions? Yes. Twenty years ago, the standard answer to the question, what should I do with my leather books, was British Museum formula or something like that. Oh, the, the, yeah. What's the answer now? Um, 
Well, that then has become a little bit contradictive, you yeah, know, because I, I get it, man. yeah. But on the other hand, I think everybody still has it around. And <coughs> if something is really dry, I mean, we've used it sometimes, but we don't do this um, this whole oiling process anymore. That used to be kind of every year, yeah. once or so. You know, you go and oil your books. Yeah. No, I'm not sure why, Peter. Do you know why it's not? I mean, uh, first of all, it was often s m used too much, and it would come through the spine. And a lot of it was just the misapplication. It was just right. when I first learned it, it was going to take this big brush, brush it on the books, let it soak overnight, right? Wipe off the excess. The problem is it seeps through the leather, it stains, and then it starts to deteriorate the paper. If your leather has red rot, it doesn't. Yeah, it that's that's the thing. It does absolutely nothing for it except make it worse. Exactly. See, so you had to have like really educated people doing it that knew the difference between this book can take it, you know, if the book has cracks or anything. And the conservators themselves wouldn't do it because, I mean, it takes too much time. You know, it's like a very labor's job and you would hire people and... We had armies of volunteers doing that stuff in some you of did. the libraries. Yeah, well, I, I did too, but um, I think you know, when you have thousands of books to do, then you want to hire people, and, and then you have to make sure these people know what they're doing. And it's not done that much anymore. At least I, I'm not aware of it. So any more questions? How, how do you sell when you're doing that? How do you sell Pardon me? How do you sell when you're doing the card? The, the one that you just showed. Yeah. How do you sew the kind of sewing? There's no sewing. It's, it's, it's all folded. So how did you do that? <laughs> 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 well, I guess you can run a part of you and maybe show you tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. But there is, no, there is absolutely oh, no folding. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. This is just okay. sits in there. That's all I want to yeah. answer the question. I will be very